Hi, everybody. I'm Jeff Mayers. I'm a, uh, with WISPolitics.com and WISBusiness.com. We're a news organization based in Madison. We do events around the state, and uh, you can check us out at WISPolitics.com and WISBusiness.com. This particular event, obviously, is an important issue uh, for this region and all of uh, the Midwest, and this is part of our Navigating the New Economy series, and you can find out about that at WISBusiness.com. So I want to um, thank um, our co-organizers and sponsors. First of all, our sponsor is Waggett, and Jeff Smoller is here with Waggett. So if you have questions on Waggett, you can find out online. Thanks very much, Jeff. <laughs> also want to thank our co-organizer, uh, the Center for East Asian Studies, David Fields, is here. Thank you, David. <laughs> and thank you, of course, to UW-Platteville, because... Uh, uh, you're an important economic booster in the region. You've been a wonderful, wonderful partner in this event. And uh, to provide opening remarks, we have the Chancellor, Dennis Shields. Please welcome Dennis. Thank you, Jeff, and thank you to uh, WISP Politics for uh, spearheading the effort to bring this to our campus and uh, making it a part of your very important work. Uh, welcome to everyone to the University of Wisconsin-Platteville and this uh, forum on the struggles uh, in Wisconsin farm country. Uh, you know, of course, our university's primary role is to provide a high-quality education to our students. But as a regional public institution, we also recognize that we have a role to play in helping this region thrive. Uh, and we take that very seriously. And so that's why when we were approached about hosting this event, uh, about these very important issues that we were extraordinarily pleased to offer uh, this venue uh, to uh, hold it. But my thanks to uh, Brad Paff, uh, uh, Secretary of Agriculture for the state of Wisconsin. Uh, Thank you. Our good friend, uh, uh, State Representative Travis Trannell, who I'll make a couple other remarks about later. Um, Keep talking so I can eat. <laughs> positive things, positive things. Uh, Paul Mitchell, Mitchell, the director of Rank Agribusiness Institute. And a landmark owner of Landmark Creamery. <laughs> Charles Irish, Emeritus Director of the East Asia Legal Studies Center. A special thank you to our host, uh, radio personality, Pam Yonke, uh, who's done... <laughs> well, actually, she's done such a fantastic job of keeping farming at the forefront of the state's awareness. Uh, and um, I didn't have anything to do with breaking her foot, so <laughs> speedy recover. Um, the plight of farmers uh, is acute across the state and particularly in southwest Wisconsin, but that's true, I think, about the ag industry across the country. The dairy industry in particular is facing unprecedented challenges. And... We hope that people view the University of wisconsin Platteville as part of the solution to those challenges. Um, recently, we've had the Dairy Innovation Hub uh, made possible on our campus in collaboration with UW-Madison and UW-River Falls. Uh, I think it is an extraordinary example of what collaboration can do, because we've worked closely with those two other institutions the remarkable uh, and necessary support of Representative Trannell to push that through, um, and the people on our campus, Dean Wayne Weber and Professor Tara Montgomery, who uh, uh, didn't mind my being a knucklehead and, and made this happen in spite of me standing in the way. Uh, it, is, it is one of the evidences of how committed this, this campus and, and, and the people on this campus to being uh, a force for good in this region of state. 
Uh, this dairy innovation hub will mean on our campus alone four to five research positions that explore the issues that directly impact our area farmers. Uh, it will provide tremendous collaborative opportunities with other campuses, with business and industry, and family farms. So that's an incredible start, but we know there's much more that needs to be done. That is, that's why I'm happy that we're hosting this forum at the University of wisconsin Platteville to discuss these crucial issues. Uh, I'm happy to turn our mic over to our distinguished uh, um, guests and remind people that these kinds of events are part of the reason why I say every day is a great day to be a pioneer. <laughs> Thanks. That was pretty good. That was almost cult-like for a minute there. Way to go, Dennis. <laughs> good afternoon, everybody. How are you doing? Good. And uh, please, let's get a couple of housekeeping items out of the way. First of all, I'm Hafer pays double at the door. There it goes, right <laughs> off the bat. Everybody relax. This is going to be fun. We're going to learn a little something and hopefully take away some new ideas. But let's make sure that we silence our cell phones. Panelists, that would include you. <laughs> Brad, there ain't anybody that important. No. Not a boy. <coughs> I had to check it myself, to be honest with you. And then uh, I also want to draw to your attention the fact that uh, my friends have put at the center of your table uh, a card or two. If you are of the mind that you've got a question for one or more of the panelists as we go along this afternoon, we welcome those. But to make sure that we are kind of kept on task, I'll have them collected. So if you write a question down, please just hold it in the air and someone from the group will be picking it up and pass it up to me for distribution to the group. Again, welcome, and thank you very much for taking time on what finally is a beautiful day in Southwest Wisconsin to uh, be a part of this conversation. We've been having these conversations across the state of Wisconsin, uh, focused in maybe a little bit more on how very closely related Wisconsin agriculture is, not just to China and Southeast Asia, but to the world marketplace as a whole. Our panelists are going to start off this morning. I'll introduce you just generally to them, and then we're going to start off with their impressions on how uh, you know, the latest trade salvo has been that China is going to be uh, re-engaging with U.S. specifically on agricultural products, 40 to 50 billion, the number that's being uh, bantered about. I'm going to have my panelists kind of start focused in on that particular headline, if you will, uh, how it may impact their areas of expertise. So I'll start right next to me. Dr. Paul Mitchell is uh, a professor of agriculture economics at UW-Madison. He's also the director of Rank Agribusiness Institute. He has turned out to be our go-to guy when it comes to taking a look at the economics of what Wisconsin farmers are facing, regardless of what they grow or produce, uh, from the difficult challenges that our dairy economy is facing right now, right on through to our corn and soybean challenges, uh, with, with weather, with markets, uh, with a lot of that. So he is our go-to man now when it comes to some of those uh, economics and trying to help us pencil it out. So please, another round of applause that Paul could join us today. <laughs> Next to him is Professor Emeritus from the UW Law School, Chuck Irish. He is bringing some really valuable knowledge to the table. Just recently, Chuck was in China where he was a, a speaker talking about China's trade relations with the United States, and that was before President Trump took office. Is that correct, Chuck, or was it after? It's, it was both before and after. Okay, well then we may, we may want to start right there. Uh, he is also the director of the university's East Asian Legal Studies Center. So please welcome Chuck for us, Emeritus. That's all right, today you're active as ever, Chuck. Don't put the Emeritus thing in there. <laughs> then our gal, Anna Landmark, uh, made the trip up from her cheese operation uh, between Monroe and Albany. She has Landmark Creamery, uh, small, as she will explain as the day goes on, but looking for bigger markets. Uh, she is a sheep milk cheese producer, and she can help uh, maybe share some insights. We're seeing more and more. She's part of what we call a soil sisters. There's a group of women that are very progressive in taking a look at how they can get started in agriculture on a small scale, perhaps looking for those niche markets. And Anna was one of the uh, real innovators that got started with that. She is now working in conjunction with Cedar Grove Cheese to not only produce her quality cheese, but also look at those new markets. So we're going to hear from Anna. Please welcome her for taking time away. <laughs> We've got our Wisconsin Ag Secretary. He, they make me say designee, but he's our boy, Brad Path. This is a farm boy from western Wisconsin that's been involved in many different facets of Wisconsin agriculture, agribusiness, and policy development. He has worked in Washington, D.C. on several different facets, both with our 
represent elected representatives from the state as well as at uh, the U.S. Department of Agriculture. He was our state executive director for the Wisconsin Farm Service Agency offices as well. So he brings a depth of knowledge to that position at a time when obviously Wisconsin agriculture needs it. Please welcome my friend Brad Path. And this dude came only for the free meal, as he will willingly admit. <laughs> Representative Travis Travis from just down the road. He is also a producer. He called and left me a voice message that said, I, um, we're just talking about agriculture, and let's try to get it done so I can get back to the farm. Because, again, the beautiful dry weather is hard to uh, turn past when you're a producer. Please welcome Travis to the panel today. So I think, Chuck, I'm going to start off with you. The question that I asked all of our panelists to initially start with is this latest discussion about uh, things being resolved. It looks like we're going to get everything back, uh, at least moving a little bit with China and the United States. The numbers I have to be particularly attuned to are agriculture, $450 billion in purchases. Obviously, this has been the story that we've had for more than a year now as far as Wisconsin agriculture. So, Chuck, as a man that's been there uh, before this administration and since, and keeping track of this and with your experiences as a uh, professor emeritus in the law field and all of the items behind the scenes outside of necessarily production agriculture, how did you respond to that? What do you see happening here? Don't bet on it. Okay. <laughs> oh, okay. You uh, don't bet on there being exports of $50 billion, which I think 50 is Trump's figure. Um, people are talking it down. But the problem is that the Chinese haven't confirmed that they, the, um, that they have agreed to buy $50 billion or any. They haven't mentioned a number. And $50 billion would be higher than ever. Than ever. Uh, the exports peaked at 29 billion, I think, uh, about six years ago, and now they're running a little bit. In the last 12 months, they're running uh, um, under 10 billion. Um, there are a number of reasons for it. The trade war is only one of the reasons, but um, so so that that also um, uh, raises questions about. You know, if Xi Jinping and Trump get together, uh, will <coughs> that um, uh, lead to um, uh, immediately lead to an increase in uh, in agricultural exports? And, and no, because you've got the problem of the African swine flu, um, the slowdown in the Chinese economy. Mm -hmm. Um, the and because of the African swine flu, you also have a shift away from pork. In because one of the things you know, if you go to China, you the Chinese don't trust what the Chinese government says, and so the Chinese government says we've got all these safeguards and it's okay to eat pork, but the Chinese don't believe them, and so they they have moved away from uh, pork production. Um, and then, of course, you've got the Brazilians. Uh, the Brazilians are smiling right now uh, because our loss in the markets is being partly, not totally, compensated by Brazilians and to a lesser, much lesser extent by the Argentinians. Sure. Um, so I would, I would look, oh, and then there is another factor, and that is Trump is holding a card in the form of additional 15% tariffs on, China, on 156 billion of Chinese imports, and the tariff is set for December 15th. And he hasn't agreed to um, not to impose those tariffs. So the, uh, the Chinese are saying, uh, we've got a way to go before we are really committed to making significant um, increases in agricultural mm -hmm. purchases. Sure, sure. So don't bet on it. Okay. Now, before we get too far, we in agriculture have a tendency to lean on lexicon, jargon. Everybody understand that African swine fever connection? Uh, it's decimated the hog population in China, which is huge, uh, kills pigs immediately. 
They are now in a ramp up phase with baby piglets, trying to get baby piglets, which could turn into an economic opportunity for Wisconsin in the form of whey milk, powdered milk, dry milk, that we could ship to them. So if, if anything, that seldom happens to me where they can't hear me. I could drop this and they'd be hearing me. Just, but if, uh, so if we get ahead of you or anything like that, don't be afraid to call us on that. We get talking our own language. You know, with that being said, though, when these kinds of newsmakers happen around the world, sometimes markets react immediately, both to the positive and to the negative. Now, this fellow, it's my immediate right, Dr. Mitchell, can tell you how quickly markets can react, buy the rumor, sell the fact kind of things, and uh, it can accelerate, decelerate our markets, not just as far as the price goes, but as far as opportunity. Paul, can you just give us a little sense on the dynamics that you've seen? You are out there working with the farmers and agribusinesses uh, across the kitchen table trying to figure out what's going, putting these pieces into a proverbial puzzle. Tell them, give them a, a sense of how drastically between the weather and this kind of newsmaking event, Wisconsin agriculture has been impacted. Yeah, sure. Um, I'll just be, most farmers don't directly export their stuff. All they watch is the local price, um, what they're getting. And so what they see is the price is going up and down and everyone's changes their mind quickly. Um, the USDA just earlier last week would have come out with the, the latest projection of yields this year. Um, because the, there's a lot of uncertainty this year. The wet spring, everything's a lot of acres weren't planted. How much was actually planted? Nobody knew for sure. Then what was it going to yield because it was planted so late? Wisconsin's most of our crops have been behind about two weeks all summer. Um, so and then now it's been still wet. They're worried about the quality. Is it going to have some mold issues in some places? It's flooded, so it might have had water on it, and then it grows longer. You know, you don't know what exactly you have. And now you worry about can't even get it out. I mean, that's it's it's even if you have great yield out there, talk to the farmers in North Dakota that finally got their corn in, and now it's got snow on it. I mean, maybe it's melted by now, but it, the weather. It, and, and then you just add more things. So, like the USDA announced, um, they went their projected U.S. corn yield went up by two tenths of a bushel for the average U.S. One sixty eight point two to four, um, one sixty eight point four bushels. The price dropped fourteen cents that day. And then the next day it goes right back up and a little bit more because that's when the blizzard hit northern, um, in the northern Great Plains. Like, oh, they got corn there, but now can they get it out? The markets are just gyrating around with that kind of stuff. There's been a lot of uncertainty at the policy level, too. It's not just weather. Um, the renewable fuel standards and stuff, the EPA was granting waivers. and There was a lot of anxiety because that meant less ethanol being sold, so less corn um, being used for ethanol. Um, August and September, it was looking, uh, everyone was really getting anxious, and then the administration earlier this month said, no, we're going to do this, and EPA is going to start stop granting these waivers. And then all of a sudden yesterday, or two days ago, I guess it would be now, it, it seems to be backing off on that again. And so it's back and forth. That, so if you're in ethanol, or you're, you're not sure what the price is doing. And that's, there's a lot of weather uncertainty this year, and there's a lot of policy uncertainty. Um, trade is just one of the sources of policy uncertainty. And there's other ones with internal policies and then adding the weather on it. There's a lot of stress out there. On this year, I, I, I think a lot of farmers would love to get this year over with um, in terms of the stress. This yeah. has been a bad year. Yeah. yeah, that's probably the way we'll remember it. You know, the thing about agriculture that I'm sure many of you have experienced or, or seen are relationships. You know, we're a small bunch of folks, really, in uh, the comparison to everybody else. Uh, if you're in agriculture, you know a lot of other folks in agriculture. And it's those relationships, to a large extent, that have, we've been capitalizing on during these difficult stretches, whether it's farmers to farmers sharing equipment or help me out with a field of spread manure or something like that, or whether it's on a bigger scale, uh, trade partners that we've known for years and years in different markets. Now all these tariffs start popping up. It's the relationship that many times keeps that business coming. I want Brad Paff, our Wisconsin Ag Secretary, to speak to that. The importance of keeping those relationships up is something that Brad has recognized for a long time. And he is working at the Department of Ag, Trade, and Consumer Protection to make sure that we're not ignoring those relationships despite headlines or policy, yep. and that we're continuing to work on relationships in other areas. Brad, I think that's work that sometimes goes unnoticed by the general public. Well, thank you, Pam, for that. I got some good and bad news. The good news is in the first six months of 2019, we exported over $1.6 billion of high quality agriculture products from Wisconsin to over 125 nations around the world. And that's great. Um, 
Sadly, it's down 7% compared to last year. Um, the, the top five agriculture export opportunities for Wisconsin are in order, Canada, uh, China, Mexico, uh, then we get into uh, Japan and South Korea. I am proud to say, though, that we at the Department of Agriculture, Trade, and Consumer Protection continuously try and build upon the existing relationships that, quite frankly, my predecessors uh, helped build uh, throughout the, all these years. We've got uh, a value chain and a supply chain put in place to make sure that we can continue to try and move products uh, from Wisconsin, ideally finish products uh, that have gone through the supply chain, and uh, move those to, again, uh, people and uh, consumers from around the world. But without a doubt, uh, going back to uh, what the two professors did share earlier, uh, this has been a challenging year. Uh, most producers obviously don't uh, necessarily uh, produce for the export market, but the export market plays such an important role in, in what is happening here in the countryside, uh, in, particularly in Grant County, because Grant County is such a very important uh, agriculture uh, county, not just in the raw production, but also in the finished product. But we do continue to uh, build upon relationships. I'd be happy to share as this uh, presentation goes on some of the uh, reverse buyers missions that we have hosted. Just uh, two weeks ago, we had World Dairy Expo uh, here in the state. We had delegations from uh, over 100 countries that uh, came to the World Dairy Expo. We were able to uh, share the Wisconsin story with them. So. I, again, I want to thank all of you for being here this afternoon and uh, being part of what I think is a very important uh, topic and conversation. I do chuckle when it says the um, new economy because I look at agriculture as being part of our economy. May it be uh, the economy that I grew up in, may it be today's economy, may it be tomorrow's economy. Agriculture is the cornerstone, in my opinion, of our economy. So thank you, Pam. You bet, Brett. Thanks. You know, we talk about the stories that uh, we're trying to relate and the relationships and that. Representative Trannell, I want you to speak for just a moment. And I'm not throwing you a curveball, Travis. I'm just asking you. So you're at the state capitol working with a lot of different people from a lot of different backgrounds. And I can't imagine what it's like to be a farm dude from southwest Wisconsin that is uh, surrounded by that, trying to help them understand the stress. They read headlines. Maybe they see a TV story that's about 90 seconds long and they think that they know. Or better yet, they talk to Mr. Google and he tells them how it is. How is that atmosphere at the State House these days when it comes to, we've always got the politics, but then when it comes to truly sharing the story of what it's like to do what you do and the weather and then those headlines, how, how well received is that information? Tell us a little bit about what that's like to be a farmer in that surroundings these days. I think you pretty much just described my job. <laughs> uh, it's, well, it's a blessing to be able to do it. Uh, when we look at the state legislature, 99 members in the assembly, 33 in the Senate, ag in the state of Wisconsin now, over a hundred billion dollar impact. It's huge, right? Dairy alone is 15% of our state's economy, I read today. There are less than a handful of us that honestly know anything about agriculture in the legislature. It is unbelievable. When our state started, the legislature was comprised pretty much of farmers and a few attorneys. Now it's uh, a lot of attorneys and, you know, me and uh, <laughs> maybe a couple others. So there's a huge disconnect. And, you know, ag's been in a downturn now for probably five years. And there's some bankers here. They could probably tell you better than I can. But... I know it was getting serious because a secretary can acknowledge politicians, we love our dairy breakfasts, right? We'll go serve our pancakes and you know smile and see 5,000 people in the morning and it works out great for us. So politicians all across the state, whether you have a huge agricultural district or not, you usually, it's part of our you know Wisconsin heritage, you have to go to those dairy breakfasts. Well, a few of them came back to me and they said, Travis, what's going on with eggs? Some of my farmers, are, they're like mad. Like, yeah, no kidding. So uh, they're starting to figure out that there's a problem and that the economy in ag is not that great. Uh, the disconnect is huge, though, because in their minds, you know, they see a, a $50,000 pickup truck, they see a $500,000 combine, you know, they don't understand, well, you know, somebody just paid a million dollars for an 80. Things in ag must be just fine. So... 
that's the bridge that we have to gap is, is how do you get them to understand that? And it's becoming more and more challenging. And my fear is that it's going to continue to get more and more challenging because now when I talk to my colleagues, at least some of them have a basis of knowledge when it comes to ag. Their grandpa farmed, their cousin farmed, maybe their uncle still does. But in 10 or 15 years, these farm, these constituents or our population, they're literally going to be generations removed from the farm. And how future legislators or future secretaries can communicate the message of agriculture to that demographic is very concerning. Mm -hmm. Oh, great. And so long as they're there, I got a job though, Travis. So come on, give me, give me a break. <laughs> but your point is well taken. And I think it's one that concerns all of agriculture, especially when we're uh, needing compassion, empathy, and there's a lot of need for that right now. You know, the voice that we're seeing and hearing more and more about these days are the the creative farmer, shall we say, somebody that took a look at a market that was underserved and tried to find a way to get in. And then through relationships, good product, and just paying attention to the market has been able to grow and to thrive. That's where I want Anna to come in. First, Anna, I want you to be sure to explain a little bit about Landmark Creamery. But she is, again, I don't know if you realize it or not, but Wisconsin is one of the, the leading states in the United States with a female farming population. Now, it may not be 200 cows and 300 acres, it might be a smaller scale, but the female's voice and impact on what Wisconsin agriculture is doing today and where it's going in the future cannot be denied. And I mentioned in uh, our openings that Anna's a part of the Soil Sisters. That's been a real uh, thriving group that's uh, given a voice to those women. So Anna, tell us the story of Landmark Creamery, how you decided to walk into that little foray and what you've been learning right along with everybody else as you've grown. Sure. So I um, I launched Landmark Creamery about six years ago, and it's actually great to see Tara Montgomery because when I was working on my cheesemaker license, we ended up a lot of the same classes and workshops because you were working on your license then too, right? And now she's transforming the department here. So it's great to see you. Um, we were some of the only women in some of those classes that we were at um, when we were going through the UW cheesemaker licensing program. Um, but so I, my start came up in part through the Soil Sisters. I actually met my business partner at a potluck um, about 10 years ago now. We didn't know that we lived in the same town, but we both had mutual interests in sustainable agriculture. Uh, she was a food writer, had a lot of relationships with chefs and restaurants um, and people in the food industry. And when we were kind of just musing and I was looking at a business plan uh, to launch cheese business, she said, hey, why don't we think about doing this together? So it was through networking, um, finding other like-minded women that I met her. Um, and secondly, I um, had tremendous benefit um, because of a uh, uh, organization called the Dairy Business Innovation Center, which was a USDA funded in part and state funded program run through DACAP. Um, that gave me access to uh, all the consultants that I could possibly need to launch a, a cheese making business. Whether it was business planning, recipe development, marketing and branding, they had all of these people with years of industry experience. Um, and I had to basically pay $100 and I had access to all of them. Um, and it was very sad when that program went away because I got in at the very tail end of it. Um, and I probably could have been growing a little bit faster if I had had more of that support um, as I was going forward. But th through them, I also was introduced to Bob Wills, who is the owner of Cedar Grove Cheese. Um, Bob built a um, small arm off of his larger cheese making facility with a small vat. And he has let a ton of cheesemakers like me come in and get started. Um, he's been huge uh, for the artisan cheese making industry in Wisconsin. Um, and so I still utilize his facility. I go make cheese um, once a week. Um, the sheep are seasonal. They milk February through September. So those are my busy months. And then over the winter, I can plan and just sell cheese through the holidays. Um, two years ago, we um, opened up our own cheese aging facility, uh, a little township outside of Verona. Um, so now I can age more cheeses. We have our own little shop. Um, we do sell nationally for as little as we are. We do make it onto trucks that are going to New York, California, Texas. Um, most of my sales right now are in Chicago and the Twin Cities. Um, 
we had hoped uh, by year six that we would be in our own cheese plant. Um, but equity is always hard to scrounge up. Um, there's not a lot of grant programs for food businesses of my size uh, to take advantage of. Um, banks obviously are reluctant to uh, make loans right now. Um, and so growth has been challenging. I think we could grow a lot faster um, if we had uh, some more access to both cash um, and other services. But um, the, the cheese industry here is competitive, but because we have such a big industry, um, there are a lot of support and a lot of um, a lot of uh, institutional, um, what am I trying to think of here? Um, it, it's, there's a lot of support in here, and I have access to a lot of resources, um, which I very much appreciate. So it's great to see John Umhofer, because the Cheesemakers Association um, has really been embracing us little, small companies um, and providing a lot of support on food safety and all of those kinds of things as well. So. I mean, the sheep milk uh, industry is emerging, very much so. We're tiny. Uh, there's just a handful of producers in the state. Um, uh, it's really ebbed and flowed. Um, at one point, I think maybe there were as many as 16. Uh, it's probably more like six to eight currently. Um, so but, you know, kind of where goats were back in the late 70s, maybe, early 80s, just getting started. So there's a ton of opportunity here. Um, we just need to fan it a little bit more. So, All right, now that we've kind of gone through that first round, and I thank you for all the background on, on uh, how you bring expertise to the table. Okay, so we all recognize that we're not having fun in agriculture necessarily. But uh, most of us want to continue to be in agriculture What's that going to take and what's that going to look like? Uh, we can talk about trade all day long. Everybody's got an opinion, and right now none of us know if we're right or wrong. Uh, Paul, I want to talk to you just a little bit, again, because you've heard the stories. You've been around. It's not like you're just a new kid come to Wisconsin trying to figure out which end we milk. You know this state's agriculture. <laughs> but you also take a look at the balance sheets, and you also know how long some of this damage can take to be turned around and restored. You know, we, we've uh, spent a lot of October, unfortunately, talking about Suicide Prevention Month. That's not a story I generally talk about in agriculture, but I sure have this year. Uh, the damage that's been done didn't happen overnight. The recovery will not happen overnight. How do we fix ourselves, so to speak, Paul? What kinds of elements, not including Mother Nature, have to start coming our way just a little bit? And what do we need to prepare ourselves as consumers, as neighbors to farmers in a community, how long do we have to tie a knot and hang on, in your opinion? Well, I mean, we've been through, you know, three, four, five years of really tight markets, and um, you can look at the, the national and the state data. Anybody in ag lending can talk about it. There's just the all the capital is gone, the working capital, the liquid capital, the current ratio, whatever you want to use for a measure. And they've been dipping into equity. You see all the numbers on, you know, we're leading the nation again in um, farm bankruptcies. Um, as a state and at the rate to, for, you know, the number of bankruptcies per farm. But it's, you know, it's only 45, which, you know, in, in the last year since, you know, June. But A, it's, it hurts for those 45, obviously. And it's it's not just any one type of dairy. It's lots of different dairies. There's other businesses in there that are, you know, cranberry growers, um, organic dairy, small dairies, big dairies. But they're just the, the, the big symptom. There's a whole lot of other ones that are um, getting out before it gets that bad. And, um I'm I'm in my 50s. I grew up in the 80s in northeastern Iowa. I I have I did the math. I've only made it 115 miles from where I grew up. We used to come to Lancaster and buy feeder pigs on the but we lived on the Iowa side of the border, um, and that was where. For thankfully, when I was younger, we didn't do farrowing. I didn't really enjoy it. I loved just the feeder pigs and not having to deal with the sows and all that. Um, and and so um, I you saw a lot. And the the 80s were bad. You know, the word crisis is out there on the in the hallway out there. I was surprised to see that. I'm not ready to call it a crisis yet, but it's not good. Um, 80s was a crisis, and 
you can talk to people then. It, it was hard on the families. And I think if you're, if you're in agriculture or non-agriculture, keep an eye on your friends that are out there. You'll see, you'll see signs of some of this stuff. Um, uh, you know, that's, there's more to it than just the, the financial ratios and the money, the lending going up. All that's just the symptom of a deeper, it's, there's a lot of stress in these households. And it's going to take a while for that, um, the, even uh, for the money to, if we had great prices, let's say, Something happens, the prices really shoot up here. Um, some of the 2019 crop gets really good prices for it. The milk prices are trending upward now. It, the, the capital has been sucked away, and it's going to take a while to build those reserves back up again. Um, it's, it's slow, and so, and this stress will stick with us for a while in farming. It's not like every farmer is struggling, but a lot of farmers are, and more than they were, you know, five years ago. And so I think there's no easy answer. Wait six months, and it'll be better. It's ags on slow trends up and down and um, I think it'll take us a few more years even after the markets recover if they do, assuming they do to get um, going again um, the hard part this time has been so many of the crops and the agricultural products we do have all been down at the same time corn and soybeans have been struggling through years of thin margins dairy's been struggling cranberry growers have been struggling you know we grow half the world's cranberries basically and they've been really struggling with low prices um, and you know, our, we have a lot of processing vegetables in this state. We're like the second largest processing vegetable state after California. They do a lot of canned tomato products, and then we come along with canned sweet corn, green beans, and stuff. We're the second largest canning vegetables or processing vegetable state in the country, and that industry is in decline. And it, you don't you, you don't think about that stuff. And that's all of these industries have been. It's no good crop to go grow. Um, you know, I guess hemp was sort of the big thing. Um, We'll see. We, we'll see. We'll see. Yeah, it's it's been a expectations management on hemp, but a lot of people are desperate for an easy answer, and I don't think there's a quick and easy answer. It's going to take a long time to get out of this trough. I want to ask Brad to explain a little bit of you know, it's tough to go to an agriculture meeting sometimes and bring positive news. Yeah. Uh, Brad and I were talking uh, well during World yep. before World Dairy Expo officially started. Yep. Uh, Brad sees what's happening out there, and farmers are obviously quick to share their stories. You are trying to be proactive. It may not necessarily play well on uh, to to non-farm folks, but you're trying to work on partnerships yes. for those farms that want to still continue to go forward. But the bank says. Right. We're holding on to your check, or they've got bills to pay that aren't going to get paid by the cows. You are working to try to create some opportunities for them. Explain what your motivation was in starting to work with divor uh, workforce development and a little bit about what you hope that that brings to the table as an option, I guess, for some of these farms. Well, thank you, Pam, for that opportunity uh, to share a little bit. I love agriculture. Uh, I, I am from a farm about 120 miles north of here. Uh, my parents were each raised on farm. I'm fifth generation farm. Um, I was raised with farm values. The farm shaped my outlook on life. I believe in agriculture, and I recognize the fact that the economy is tough right now. I think we all recognize that. But I ask all of you just to take a step back and just think about what makes this special in our state. Number one, as the representative stated, Agriculture contributes over $104 billion annually to our state's economy. One out of every nine people that have a job in this state have a job in agriculture. We have one of the most advanced supply chains for agriculture than any other state. We can have a raw commodity that comes from a farm field or a dairy barn in Grant County, and it can be made into a finished product here in Grant County to be exported around the world or domestically. We have that. Our forefathers built that. Now we have to step forward and make the investments. Now we gotta to continue to invest in that. The representative mentioned the fact that the state legislature passed the Dairy Innovation Hub. Those are opportunities. Opportunities to bring money back to the countryside. We have a lot of farms in this state, over 7,500 dairy farms, and we have close to 60,000 farms in this state. Every one of them is an economic engine. We should invest in them, just like we want to invest in industry and other high tech. We should invest in agriculture, on the farm all the way to the processing. You heard Anna's story. We can do that. But we also recognize the fact that the economy is changing. 
We recognize the fact that some people are leaving agriculture, sadly. But they want to stay involved. And so what Pam mentioned, and this is a back to the future concept, this came from 2006, 2007, when the legislature worked with former Governor uh, Doyle, and they created an Agriculture Workforce Development Board, Education Board. Quite frankly, what that is, is to make sure that we have people who may be leaving, quote, production agriculture, but want to stay involved. In agriculture, if you're farming, you know how to weld. If you're farming, you know how to do mechanics. If you're farming, you've got a pretty good idea how to communicate with other farmers. You can do fertilizer sales, you can do seed sales, there's a lot of different things you can do. Let's keep these people in agriculture. They may not be milking the cows, and they may not be harvesting the corn or the soybeans, but they have a role to play in agriculture in our rural communities. I want them to be here in Grant County or back home in La Crosse County where I'm from. I want them part of that. I think all of us want that. So that's what I'm hoping to do. Um, again, we're not asking for anything new. This is already on the books. It's a statute. It's already on the books. It's just recreating and kind of it's a back to the future as far as this agriculture workforce uh, education tool. We're going to need the assistance of many of you in, uh, uh, in your organizations that are here in this room to talk about how we can get this back up and off the ground. But I also want you to think about what we can do for production agriculture. Professor Mitchell's right. We can't snap our fingers and change the price overnight, but we also can't just rest on what we've already done. Let's build on what we've got. Build on this supply chain. Build on these farmers. Build on our work ethic. Build on our heritage and our culture. That's what we can do, and that's what I hope to do. And I think you're hearing that from uh, the state representative as well. He recognizes this. We all recognize this. So, um, again, I just think that uh, the more we can do, the more we tell our story, and that's what I really want to be able to do because uh, the representative hit the nail right on the head as far as trying to tell the story about production agriculture, and Anna did a great job of talking about how she's trying to communicate. We can do that in this state. That's what makes it so unique. So thank you, Pam. Yeah, you bet. Well, and it's at a time, uh, contrary to, I, I was in college in the 80s, and there were no jobs, and interest rates started at 16%. So that's to your point about why are we calling this a crisis. That was a crisis when farmers were digging trenches around their farms so the sheriff couldn't foreclose. Um, we don't want this to continue for any long, but just to give you a little perspective from an old broad in the room. Let's talk a little bit about that stress set situation, though. Travis, I want you to, again, buddy, you're, you're kind of our bridge uh, between what you hear at the state capitol, what you see as far as policy development from your peers, and then the real life coming home. You know, theoretically, we could say you've got an off-farm job going as a state representative to uh, take care of business there. You have neighbors that may have faced, we're not getting it paid just with the cows, with the crops. Uh, how many, share with them how many neighbors you have where she works at the hospital or teaches or does something to keep the insurance or maybe now he's looking at driving school bus or doing something. Help them understand what it's like to live this right now. You got bills to pay. Oh, you sure. get, you know, and, and now you're thinking about next year. I'm assuming, perhaps I'm wrong, I'm assuming you intend to farm in 2020, regardless of what nastiness we dredge up here. See, we're eternal optimists. We're already trying to think about how it's going to get better next year. Now, some of you may say, nuts. Uh, um, yeah, but to help them understand, Travis, today you're thinking about, I want to go harvest, and then the guy's going to sit around your kitchen table and try to order seed for you for next year while you watch what happens at the state house. Paint for us a little bit that picture. It's funny you mention that. I don't know, uh, for those of you that don't farm, typically we don't see tons of grain drills running in the fall. I've seen more grain drills running in the last two weeks than I've probably seen my entire life. And I believe a lot of that is because of what you just said. It's been tremendous stressful growing season in 2019. And farmers are just putting in a crop mm -hmm. so that they have something, something to look forward year. to. Boom, we're going to be able to harvest something. We yep. just got to get to 2020. Mm -hmm. uh, when you said 16% interest rates from the 80s, there was a part of me that thought, 
you know, that wouldn't be so bad because then you're right, I wouldn't be farming in 2020. <laughs> so that would alleviate a lot of stress <laughs> for a lot of people, I think, because I don't think any of us could float 16% interest rates today. Uh, mental health is a huge thing, and I do, I, I'm glad that you brought that up. Uh, for two reasons. So you mentioned that I kind of have an off-farm job, and I, I guess I would agree with that, even though I'd probably never admit it, because I, I will always uh, self-identify as a farmer. But having an off-farm job, honestly, has been good for my mental health. Even, you know, yesterday morning, we chopped until 3 a.m., uh, to be quite honest, our farm's still running today. We're chopping right now. We're putting winter rye in right now. We've got cows that are getting milk, calves that are getting fed. But there's a small part of me that was happy that I got to get in the car and, you know, shower and get a good meal. Uh, so it's uh, the mental health aspect is huge. But then I also want to be careful when we talk about that. Because when you talk about things like suicide prevention and some people that aren't involved in agriculture that don't understand what's going on, they want to know, well, like, what's up with these farmers? What's wrong with their mental health? Like, is there, they have something going on? Their mental health, it's fine. They can't pay their bills. Yeah. And I think we need to separate mental health from not being able to pay your bills because they're two separate issues. Uh, I wrote down a few notes, you know, one thing I circled, there's a lot of stress out there. Another thing I circled, a lot of stress in these households. Like, I mean, we've talked entirely today pretty much about stress. And that stress is so real. But I don't think the general public understands that because when I hear that we're doing a speaker's task force on mental health and we're going to be a component of it that focuses on agriculture, two or three million dollars towards mental health for agriculture is not going to do a darn thing, okay? Let's be honest about that. Farmers need markets to sell product to at an affordable price so that they can pay their bills. Short of that, you're not going to accomplish anything. And that's kind of why I really enjoy having two jobs because I feel like I'm in the state house enough to know what's going on there, but I also live in the real world. I'm on a water quality task force where we went around the state 14 or 15 public hearings where we listen to the public testify about water quality for hours and hours and hours. Great ideas. But them, a lot of them will never work in the real world. And that's what concerns me as we get more and more re removed from agriculture. We just have a lot of people that don't understand how it actually works. So uh, I'm thankful that the secretary is, is so committed because what we do have is fantastic. And honestly, what I think we need to start focusing on, we focused, in my opinion, the last 40, 50 years on how can we produce enough food to feed the world, a growing population. I've been hearing that since I was a kid. I don't know. I would assume all of you have been. A year ago, I was in Kansas City, Missouri. The deputy secretary of the US Department of Agriculture said that. I went up to him afterwards, and I said, sir, do you know where bean prices are, where corn prices are, where dairy prices are, where cranberry prices are? We have enough production. Like, we're very good at producing things. We need to start figuring out the next component, in my mind, and that is rural America, the health of rural America. Farmers, 2% of us can feed the world, and then some. I mean, look at our stocks now. We're, we don't have a food shortage coming. Uh, but farmers, you know, you talked about work ethic and people that can weld. You know, when this country, God forbid, does face a problem, if there are no farm kids to turn to, That's right. we're going to have a, a, a real situation on our hands. So these conversations are much more about food and how do we feed a growing population. It's, it's in my opinion, it's not a crisis, but society is definitely at a crossroads. I gotta ask you, Travis, because I struggle trying to tell this story. We have, uh, you mentioned uh, mental health, I just gotta pay my bills. If you are not, if you don't know a farmer, if you didn't grow up on a farm, that farm is my identity. Mm -hmm. If I can't pay my bills, that's a personal reflection on me. If I lose this farm, think about my grandparents, my great-grandparents. So help people, under for the non-farm, help people understand. We carry, we have a very strange connection with what we do, why we do it, where we're at. This cow, that 40, this tractor. And as that tractor goes up on the back of the truck, that, that is my mental... Oh, that's you. That's you know what, what you said. Yeah, it's... Uh, if, if you're not involved in agriculture, I think you hit the nail on the head. A rational person probably looks at what we do and says, you're nuts. Uh, my brother is... Uh, we're very close. We're best friends, but he's not a farmer. 
And, you know, so he kind of challenges me to look at the world differently than how I would say that we were raised. So when I was raised, we were taught that, you know, hard work and, you know, if you work 20 hours a day, that's fantastic. And that's how you get ahead. Where my brother, he would probably tell you that, you know, how hard you work really has nothing to do with how much money you make. And, you know, farming is a perfect example of that because one way that uh, we have dealt with the stress is we do what we know how to do, and that's work. So we just keep working and keep working and keep working. But I think now, five years later, we're starting to feel like we're not getting ahead, and that's what really concerns me. Yeah, right. yeah. Inter- yeah I, exactly. Anna, can you chime in? The, the, yeah. That work thing, sure. that work thing resonates well, with all I mean, of my, us. My grandfather was a dairy farmer in the 80s, and he retired um, almost well, pretty early on into the crisis because he was losing money and he didn't want to lose the rest of his retirement. So, and he, um, you know, one of my aunts or uncles might have taken over the farm and continued milking, but he absolutely discouraged it. Um, He put all his farmland into CRP so nobody could touch it for a while. And then later on, he eventually started renting it out to another farmer. Um, But that's a beautiful farm that's still just basically sitting now. Um, One of my cousins owns it, and there's no incentive for him to go into farming. So it's going to just be rented um, and sit. A lot of it's just going to sit fallow for a long time. Um, but I, uh, I was getting calls, multiple calls a month um, from small producers largely who were getting dropped by their um, milk buyers um, for, well, it's probably been about two years uh, that I've been getting calls. Um, they've been slowing now, but I think that's because they're going out of business or they're selling um, not because there's maybe less of them. Um, And it's really, really hard to have conversations because they are feeling desperate. Um, They're they're sad. They don't have a lot of alternatives. Um, And if I had my own plan, I might have been able to pick up a few of them. Mm -hmm. Um, But for the most part, I I didn't have the ability to pay them for their milk. I just don't have enough cash flow through my business. and I know DACAP was putting in a lot of work trying to help um, producers find buyers, um, and everybody was at capacity. All of the plants were at capacity. I know Bob Wills picked up um, a couple of them also. Um, and so it is, it's really, it is really challenging. Um, and on the, there, I know that there's a lot, of, a lot of young people, a lot of women who are very interested in going into farming, um, but finding that opportunity right now um, is, you know, makes it almost impossible. So I do have to, there are some farms though that are doing some really creative things and trying to help kind of the next generation. You guys probably know Paul Bickford. He just set up this amazing relationship. I mean, he was a conventional dairy. He converted to organic. So he's always kind of been um, willing to transform his farm. And right now he's in the process of (coughs) transforming it over into a new family who are going to be raising grains. Um, They're going to be raising wheat and they have Lonesome Mill um, grinding their uh, flour for them and their business is kind of taking off. Um, But we we need to, I think, really look at expanding the diversity um, of sizes of farms. And I'm always going to fight for the little farms and just get, having them um, get more recognition um, in the banking industry and with um, policy and other programs because there are people who are really hungry to get into farming. And I think it makes our whole system more resilient if you've got a more a greater diversity of sizes in farms and also types of crops and stuff too. So, I mean, I chose sheep milk because it was niche, right? It was an opportunity for me in an industry that was very dominated by cow milk to start small um, and to find an opportunity to to grow. Um, And there's a lot of people who are hungry to do that. Um, So, yeah, I mean, right now I think a lot of the policy is geared towards helping the big farms, and they absolutely need help, and I don't want to discourage that, but we also need to find ways to support the small farmers, too, who are looking to get in. Well, we're all in this, regardless of size. I think the economics are not picking uh, favorites here. Uh, One thing I just want to remind you, thank you again, first of all, for sticking with us. Hope the conversation is uh, keeping you engaged. You do have cards on your table. If there's something that's kind of piqued an interest in you or you've got a question or something like that, please uh, scribble it out as best you can. 
so that I can read it and then just hold it up. And I've got folks that will collect uh, the card and we'll try to make sure that we incorporate that in. I want to continue to talk a little bit about resolution. Uh, we're not here to, uh, although it may be difficult, I'm not going to be a Debbie Downer. We want to try to find out what we can do uh, to find some of the resolution to this, even if it's just in the state of Wisconsin and you've heard some great suggestions. Chuck, God bless you. I am not forgetting you, my friend. And I apologize for getting a little deep in the weeds on the farm side of things. One of the challenges, you know, today agriculture is very, very driven by technology. I'm, I often try to make the point to my folks on uh, television that, you know, if the power goes out on a farm today, that's a big deal because everything is mechanized, everything is software driven. I bet if I asked uh, Travis or Paul to pull up their smartphone or Brad or even Anna, I uh, bet you'd be stunned to see all the software that they're carrying around on their mobile devices or whatever that can monitor grain temperature, uh, knows what cows in heat. I mean, it's very sophisticated. Um, that technology is something that we are learning to embrace more and more in all sizes of agriculture because of the lack of people that want to do our job or be with us. Technology and, and what comes with it has also kind of been a major sticking point on what we started with, and that is our international relationship with others. Everybody wants to protect what they've got, don't want to share, don't want you to steal it. Chuck, we, when we were bantering earlier this week, uh, you know, intellectual property is one of these things, and I make no fun, the, the cloud is out there. All this inter intellectual property, agriculture's got a big stake in that. Our seed genetics, so all the traits, our, our genetics of any type, uh, all of those kinds of things, that technology. Chuck, give me your perspective now that you've had a chance to hear about the agriculture on both sides of you. That's one area that you and I were talking on our conference call this week that is not going to be easily resolved, no matter how you want to paint it in popular press or on the media. Give me your, your sense on what you just heard these folks express. They're trying to get through. They're just trying to get their job done. And uh, do we have to have intellectual property be part of the resolution before we're going to get anything moving? <laughs> the, uh, 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 the, before I get to intellectual property, there is something that people are uh, uh, hopeful about that maybe people don't, don't know. I travel a lot throughout North and Southeast Asia. Wisconsin is a brand in that part of the world. It is very well known. And it also is a place of significantly growing affluence. And so it probably is worth your while to pay attention, not just to China. China is going to be a prickly market for certainly my lifetime um, and probably for a good portion of yours. <clears throat> Excuse me. But there are, there are many of the other Asian, Northeast and Southeast Asian countries that represent significant markets for you. Intellectual property, man, um, uh, you have to be careful. If now they're 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 different, it's it's different whether you are uh, dealing with China or Japan, Korea, um, or Taiwan. There are very effective protections for intellectual property in the last three places. There are, the law is there in China, but the enforcement is not. And it's, um, uh, the, when, and the Chinese are very good negotiators. You go into the Chinese market, they're going to be uh, a very, it'll be a very attractive market. Uh, what you may find, though, is that the cost of doing business includes with, with or without your knowledge um, a transfer of technology. And that in one, no, uh, five, eight years, the number one competitor used to be your good buddy from Shanghai is now a major competitor, has closed off your market in China, and is a big, um, and may even be a competitor here in the US. That's likely to change um, 
in uh, over the medium term. And the reason isn't because of the trade war or the pressure that successive administrations, this is not a Trump issue, this goes back uh, tw at least 20 years to um, in the protection of intellectual property in China. And China has resisted and resisted and resisted, but they have reached a point where China realizes that it's in its economic self-interest to provide adequate protections for intellectual property. There is this thing, maybe some people have heard, it's called China 2025. Uh, the idea of significant self-sufficiency and the development of an indigenous technological sector in China, a global uh, competitor in technology. But the only China understands, the people in Beijing understand the only way they can do that is if they have effective protections for intellectual property. Right now, you have to be really, really careful. Five or eight years from now, you may find it is a much easier market. Straight exports, though, mm, I would think that mm, um, East Asia, both North and South, would offer a very attractive market. And just um, the, 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 the red of Wisconsin, is well recognized throughout the region. The only place you can't wear red would be in Thailand because they have a division between the yellow shirts and the red shirts. And if you wear red, the yellow shirts are gonna beat you up. But other, other than that, it's okay. And if I wear Packers, does the red beat me up then? Uh, yeah, pa a cheese head hat would work. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you again for your questions. I'll, I'll stay with you, Chuck, because we've got a question from the audience. So who's winning the trade war right now? Um, it, oh, uh, <laughs> who's winning right now? You know, if, um, um, if you ask this question in just about any part of China, in Beijing or in one of the small villages in China, um, you will have almost universal um, uh, agreement. China is going to win this war. It is, this is something that's been 150 years coming, and China is going to reclaim its position as pre, uh, preeminence in the world. And this trade war, China's going, uh, China will win that trade war. You come here, um, or just about anywhere in the US, and you look at the <laughs> might and the values of, of the United States, and you said, um, we're, we're going to prevail, uh, in part because we're right. Um, the issues that Trump is arguing about are these issues have been been in existence for quite some time. And the sad thing is Trump missed a major opportunity to join, to get the other uh, uh, Western countries, plus Japan and Korea, on, on the American side. And it was a, uh, his style to go it alone. But everybody who is a major trading partner, a uh, player, agrees that China has significant problems and Trump has identified the three major issues that are the core of, of it. Uh, the way the, um, it's clear to uh, who the losers are, um, it's agriculture, uh, US agriculture, it's the Chinese economy, the American consumer, um, even the global economy is suffering. How will it play out? Um, the stakes are so high on both sides that I expect that that the that the that on both sides they will declare a victory and they will walk away without much changing, including without much change in the major structural problems with the Chinese economy. 
Um, and uh, they'll do something. They'll maybe boost um, agricultural trade. Um, there will be some lip service to a new law on intellectual property, but China already has plenty of laws on intellectual property, but they just aren't enforced. Um, and and so uh, I expect that that it will just kind of uh, uh, fade away as um, without any clear resolution. Very good. With that being said. Uh, we are still living with ramifications, whether they're winning or we're winning, of uh, poor commodity prices and a struggling uh, farm economy that drives a lot of our small communities. One of the questions is, uh, talk a little bit about how our rural communities are being impacted. Remember, a lot of farmers are uh, volunteer firefighters. They sit on the school board. I mean, they make a big impact. They're, was a time, and maybe I'm showing my age, where they said every time that uh, a farmer got a dollar, they, it multiplied 10 times in the community for how they uh, bought things. And, you know, I know that there's this thing called Amazon and big stuff like that, but a lot of farmers still choose to purchase in their communities. Paul, maybe you can help bridge this a little bit. Uh, you know, we talk a lot about the balance sheet on the farmers, but we don't necessarily always equate or come up with... Uh, charts and graphs on how that ripples out to our rural communities. Again, like I said, you live it, you breathe it, you're out there. Um, if the farmers are not able to, uh, you know, support the school, can't uh, necessarily, don't go out for Friday night fish. I mean, it may sound small, but that can really have quite a ripple. Can you maybe speak to what you've seen, either on paper or in person, my friend? Um, the one thing, I, I grew up in Iowa, and, you, you, you know, we did, we did beef and um, hogs and um, corn and hay. But um, you just, it just, what you sold just disappeared. You didn't really think about it, where the pigs went. Um, and then I went to grad school, did all my stuff, and then eventually came, you know, ended up in Wisconsin in 2004. And then you get involved in your exposition. You start to learn more about your state. Um, the one thing I think people in Wisconsin don't realize, including farm kids, I see them in my classes, how much food manufacturing there is in this state that is not in other states. Um, Iowa, it ends up going somewhere else. Um, Wisconsin has, like we make a lot of frozen pizzas here. Um, Kerry uh, ingredients in Glambia are shipping whey proteins all around the world and they're like major players in that world. DeLong um, ships um, grains, um, food grade soybeans, stuff like that out of southern Wisconsin. They're like the largest exporter of this stuff in the world or in the Midwest. Um, and you don't realize that's here. And the same thing, like we have the second largest processing vegetable industry. It, it seems like people don't realize that, but that there's a lot of spinoff for all these other things. So like that's why there's all these cheese plants here and all this food manufacturing here. That's why we have um, these smaller cheese plants can now operate because there's these other, when there's a part that breaks, it only comes from a few, uh, you know, 50, 100 miles away. It doesn't come from California or something like that. It's fixed within hours, not days. Um, and there's all that kind of stuff we don't realize. And so I think uh, that's why I think we want to keep that stuff here. And that, um, now I lost track of what the question was. Just talking about how the, when agriculture suffers. Oh, you know. yeah, yeah. And that's, that's our spinoff <laughs> there. And so our local, it's the farmers, the more times people in your state, your region touch it, the more, sp more economic impact it has. And that's what we have here. When you just create a raw product and ship it out of your, out of your state, it has a far smaller impact in your community. And so um, that's what a, a advantage Wisconsin Ag has is our, our raw commodities are touched by a lot more people in the state. They're not shipped to Texas and manufactured into food. They are, a lot of them are manufactured here in the state. And so um, it's not just the farmer, it's everyone down the supply chain that touches the food um, or the, the raw product. And I think, and that's where all these jobs are that we need. Um, I, we've been on different task force and stuff. Um, and the workforce development has been, it's a, it's a perennial issue in the Midwest. They're having a hard time getting people to stay here or move here. All these industries need these people here and they need the skill set. I mean, there are they're desperate for people who can fix machinery, who can um, go out and sell stuff, who can do accounting and book work, all that kind of stuff, all that support industry, either the technical or the business side of it. Um, we need those people here. And I, it's, it's a tough sell because so many people don't realize how, how much opportunity there is in agriculture. At, at the University of Wisconsin, it's not like here at Platteville. I'm guessing you more a portion of your students are from agricultural backgrounds. I teach a, a class, and I'm in ag business management. I teach farm management, of course. 
probably two thirds of the students in that class are not from farms. Um, and so my job in that class is just to introduce them to agriculture so that they can be an ag business person and understand um, just you know what a cow is and where how milk come where it comes from. You have to explain what a steer is. Um, I I was laughing beforehand. My my daughter said she's at work. She's 27 and working. She's I was in the office or in the the store today and I was like the stud, you know. And I said, you're actually not the stud. You're a girl. <laughs> um, you know. And I explained to her what a stud was and it's like, oh okay, you know. And so it's just simple stuff like that. But um, it's you have to you have to, I part of my job is just recruiting people into ag business broadly speaking because um, and they and it, there's a lot of young men and young women who want are looking for something that like, like want to get into farming or in agriculture they they're from suburban Minneapolis suburban Milwaukee area and that's what they're and so there are tons of opportunities here and that's what generates the bigger spin the big multiplier effect from what farmers do you know and we laugh but I've had this story commiserated to me many times. How would you like to be the farmer sitting across from a lender that didn't grow up on a farm? Mm -hmm. How would you like to be the farmer that's got a high grade, or a registered Holstein cow that's worth so much in embryos and the vet that's coming out has never worked a large animal? I mean, your heart just stops if you're the farm kid. So yeah, appreciate it's, uh, We're graduating our ag business majors, and we're finally going on a farm tour and visit the Cedar Grove cheese plant um, next week because a chunk of these people have never been on a farm, but they're going to be an ag business major. Yeah. Now, vet school told me that they had to change their curriculum because there were students that objected to uh, surgery on a frog. Stone cold serious. You think this is part of my stand-up routine. It is not. Stone cold serious. <laughs> You know, talking a little bit more about that, Brad, you hit the pavement in a lot of areas of Wisconsin that I haven't seen for a long time. And people are up talking to you that are on the school board, that are on the town county board. Are they noticing changes yet? We mentioned agriculture's been in this for at least a good five years. Are they bringing up how their communities have been impacted by the downturn that their farm neighbors have been experiencing? The answer is yes. They definitely are impacting it. And um, we all want to grow. We all recognize that um, you know, tomorrow's a new day. We all want the opportunity to participate in the next great thing. But we also recognize the fact that in Wisconsin, agriculture is who we are. We, can, we need to recognize the fact that agriculture is the new thing. Agriculture is where the opportunities are. And the great thing about what we have in our state is we have farms all over our state. This isn't California where there's just pockets of agriculture. We have agriculture everywhere. And the thing is, is that what we need to be able to do is we need to be able to connect economically, but we also need to be able to connect culturally and socially. Because, believe me, bushels, bales, and hundredweights are important. We all understand that. But as the representative brought up earlier, and Pam, as you brought up earlier, the farm has more than just a monetary value to us. The farm also represents, quite frankly, who I am, who you are, who we are. And so, you know, to see that tractor or that being sold, or to have, you know, your cows loaded up and sold, that's more than just a commodity. But yet, we know we have to live in an economic marketplace. Farmers understand economics. They understand economies of scale. But they also, this is where they raised their kids. This is where they were raised. This is where life lessons were taught. How do you put a value on that? And the more we lose farms going out, these communities are impacted. Obviously, the schools and the civic institution, the churches, they're impacted. And people feel that they're lost. They've lost part of themselves. And so, you know, I've greatly enjoyed this job in the nine months I've had the opportunity to do this. And because I like people. And, and I look at this job as an opportunity to listen and to learn because I want to find markets. I want to build upon our supply chain. I believe we can find more differentiated products. I believe we can be more innovative and creative. But I also, you know, I, I know what it means to be from a farm or be from a rural community, to know what 
Friday night high school football means. Um, I, I know what that means, and I, you do too. And so how do we create policy? How do we create policy, as the, as the state representative mentioned, but how do we make this economically viable? This is hard. This is really hard, but that's why I'm excited to be here, to be part of all of this. Um, I don't have all the answers, but I can tell you that I absolutely love getting out and listening to farmers um, because, you know, quite frankly, you know, farmers are, farmers are my heroes. They're who, you know, it's where I grew up, and uh, it's what we uh, listen to every single day is uh, that's what we need to do is figure out how we can continue to can make, pay our bills, but at the same time connect with who we are and our neighbors and our community. That's why Wisconsin, in my opinion, is different. I can't speak, again, for California or for New England or for Iowa or anything else, but that's why Wisconsin is so different and so unique. And um, that's why, again, Pam, I hope we have more opportunities like this to have conversations because as important as this is in Platteville and Grant County, believe me, it's just important in Oconto County or you know, Pierce County, wherever it may be, it's just as important. Mm -hmm. And so, um, yeah, people are out there, they're asking all the time, what can we do? Uh, they, all have, they all have thoughts on trade. They all have thoughts on you know, what's gonna happen with the markets. They all have, but at the end of the day, um, they want the best price, but they also recognize the fact when, if they can't get that best price, they're gonna lose more than just their job. As the representative mentioned, they're losing part of who, who they are. So. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you, you touched on an interesting point, and this is a question from the audience, and I'll try to uh, tighten it up a little bit. Often agriculture is asked about sustainability. Uh, sustainability, just by definition, is tricky, especially if you're in agriculture. Uh, the question is, are we paying attention to the sustainability of our land, our resources in Wisconsin? Uh, there was a time not very long ago where uh, commodity prices were so attractive that a lot of farmers decided they were going to go corn, beans, and some have not uh, necessarily changed their patterns. Travis, I'm going to I'm going to start with you because of your water quality engagement, uh, the fact that you're on the land, and to your point, some of the things that people want from you as a farmer are not economically attainable or make sense. But sustainability is tricky. How do you uh, define sustainability? when you get into these conversations, because it's the hot, it's the buzz phrase. Agriculture needs to be sustainable. Now we've got the economic influence outside our borders, and now we've got the day-to-day -day economics to try to stay sustainable. Just run with it, baby. We got 15 yeah, minutes left. That's a great question. So sustainability, I think, depends upon who you ask. If you ask a farmer in the audience what sustainable farming means, that means they can pay their bills and they can have their kids join the farm and it can go on for another 50 or 100 years like it has previously. If you ask what sustainability is to a consumer, they probably have a completely different answer and, quite frankly, a completely different mindset. And so I guess when we talked earlier about having a foot in both worlds, that's where there's, there's so much conflict between what the consumer wants and what they're willing to pay for. You know, part of the conversation that we haven't had here today is a lot of the reason that we're having this discussion is because food in this country is so cheap. And so the 98% of the people that aren't involved in agriculture but still eat three times a day, they're benefiting, right? I mean, we have the cheapest food in the world. The professors could probably confirm that. Other developed countries, they spend anywhere from 10, 15, 20% of their take home pay on food. We spend about five to six. So even though farmers can't pay their bills these last five years, they're still feeding everybody. So you ask that farmer, is this sustainable? They're gonna say no. You know, they put in the corn and they put in the beans because they can't milk the cows anymore. They still have to get some revenue from the land. What do they want? Our federal ag policies, in my opinion, are so messed up. We're encouraging more production of corn and beans even though we're oversupplied. Yet that has detrimental effects to the sustainability of water quality and erosion. And I could talk for hours on that. So, uh, in the long term, in my opinion, we need to come up with a system where farmers can still produce enough food to feed, feed the country and export, feed the world at an affordable price, but still make sure that our land is going to be around for generations to come. And, and you know, that's sustainable to me. 
but other people, I mean, that, right. that everybody has their own answer. Anna, what's sustainable to you? It's, I mean, it's a combination. Get up on the microphone. Sorry. It's a combination of economic sustainability, but also environmental, right? We, I mean, Wisconsin used to be one of the leading wheat producers until that crashed. Um, and I think a lot of people are feeling like maybe we're heading in the same direction with corn, but I think we still have plenty of time to halt that. Um, this region in particular has been kind of a hotbed on water quality, as Travis knows, um, with the water, the swig water testing that's happening, um, and a lot of issues with um, homeowners' wells. Um, and they're looking at what the causes are, which... It, it, agriculture certainly has an impact. There are other factors too, though, with septic systems. And uh, there's just a lot. I think we're, we're behind um, the curve on knowing about our soils and our lands and our bedrock. And so we need to catch up um, and figure out what that science is. Um, I think we're also facing an issue where uh, a lot of the people who own the land aren't doing the farming. They don't live on the land anymore. Um, and I think that's creating a disconnect in some places. And we're getting a lot of um, corporate ag companies coming in and setting up really big operations um, because they've maybe run out of water in other states like Nebraska and stuff. So they're coming here for our resources. Um, and they don't necessarily have this same relationship with the land and the same care for it, and so I think that's why you're seeing more and more communities fighting um, the like CAFO dairies and things like that. Um, and there's growing interest in fighting, you know, consolidation and the vertical integration that's happening when you have Walmart owning the um, dairy and the bottling facility, um, and then the product is going straight into their stores and they own all the trucks. That's not money that's ever reaching that community where that dairy is or where their bottling facility is. It's going straight into Walmart's pockets. They're not going down to the local hardware store to buy equipment if something breaks. They're using their own. They're bringing in their own vets. Um, so well, that's Indiana. <laughs> that's Indiana. Yeah. Uh, Travis? Yeah, you... so, so she, she just sparked an idea in my head because, I mean, we're talking about sustainability, so I'm on this water quality task force. One of the things that we're learning is that, you know, sometimes what's sustainable both for the land and the economics is in direct conflict with what the public wants. So we talk about CAFOs, you know, as the secretary can tell you, they're 100% regulated, zero discharge. They know where every gallon of their manure is going. They're not fall applying. But the consumer probably wants sustainable to be a little red barn milking 30 cows, even though that producer is probably hauling manure on a daily basis, has no idea where it's going, etc can't pay their bills. So the CAFO is probably more environmentally sustainable, more economically sustainable because they can pay their bills, but not as good in terms of a social aspect in a healthy rural economy. So that, uh, that's why our jobs are hard. <laughs> yeah, well, and you're not the only one. I mean, just trying to uh, um, make sure that people are correct when they start sharing knowledge about right. corporate in Wisconsin, 95% of our farms are still family owned, even if they look big to you from the outside. So uh, perspect or pers your perspective versus reality can sometimes be skewed, but we aren't going down that road. We've got just five minutes late, uh, left. I want to give our, our group a round of applause for going all over the place with us in the past hour and a half. As we uh, wrap to a close, I just want to thank our sponsors again for bringing this together. I had the privilege of being able to moderate a, a similar conversation up in Wausau. That was specifically as everything was burbling with China, and we involved the ginseng growers of Wisconsin, which uh, we, are, we are the market for China when it comes to ginseng. But yet here in Wisconsin, we know so very little about it. So these dialogues, these conversations of uh, different backgrounds, different uh, you know, experiences, a knowledge base, experiences on the international scene, and sharing that dialogue face-to-face -face instead of an article on the internet or something you heard on the radio or saw 90 seconds of, I think helps all of us in the community better understand what we're facing and how uh, very difficult it's going to be no matter what uh, we hear about China and the United States. That being said, again, I want to welcome back to the podium for a few closing thoughts as he's uh, taken in all this information, Chancellor Dennis uh, I ho hopefully you learned a little bit about Wisconsin agriculture these past hour and a half. Uh, this has been fabulous, and I appreciate the panel's uh, work and commentary. Um, but I'm going to take a point of privilege and sort of point something else out to you, and, and I hope the audience will bear with me. Um, 
Would everybody that teaches or works at this university or used to work at this university please stand up? So what I, I would tell this audience and the audience that will see this later is these are the people going to produce the workforce that's going to man these farms. And uh, I think the University of Wisconsin-Madison is a great place and contributes to the state in a lot of ways. But it's the students who come to this campus and campuses like it that are going to be the workforce of Wisconsin in the future. So thank you. Sit down. And I'd, I'd like to make another point, and, and let, let me just first say that um, uh, Travis and I don't always agree on all our politics, but there's one question that I can answer in the affirmative. He's been a, 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 a very fierce advocate for this campus, um, and, and that is remarkable. Uh, from time to time, he will take me to task um, for things he has issues with that we might do or be talking about here, and that is entirely appropriate. Um, uh, the criticism of uh, a university, you know, as a chancellor, I, I, I freely accept the, the need to accept that cr criticism and move forward. But because of the vital role that it plays across all of these things, it can't all be criticism. It has to be supported. I, most of these folks that stood up here I know fairly well. I know how deeply they care about this university and the students that they produce and the impact that we have on this state. So will we screw up as a university from time to time? Will things that happen on the campus be things that you might agree or disagree with? Yes. But at the end of the day, the people who are going to populate this state, the people who are going to provide the workforce and make sure that this state thrives in the future are the folks that attend this institution, the students that attend this institution, and the other regional publics ac across the state. So criticize us when we do things you don't like, but you still got, it's, we're like your kids, right? <laughs> right? You want them to do the right thing and move down the right path, but you don't want them to think you don't love them. So I would urge you to continue to show that you love us. We will continue to do these sorts of things to give you a chance to, to speak to the issues that you want to. And I, I, I will close with that. I really appreciate the work that this panel has done in WIS politics and the whole group that made this happen. Thank you. Good job. Thank you, Chancellor, for staying with us. There's a lot of chancellors that would come in and say hello, welcome, and then be off on a, to a meeting. Thank you for staying. <laughs> Thank you, though, very much for staying and engaging in the dialogue. Ladies and gentlemen, with that being said, I'm sure that many of you didn't write down your questions or I didn't get a chance to ask them. Thank you for your input and your kind attention. Our panelists will be around. Uh, I know that there's a lot of one-on-ones that are just waiting to bust. My name is Pam Yankee. They call me the fabulous farm babe on uh, TV and radio. And I very much appreciate this opportunity to try to help drive this dialogue. Let's keep it going. Have a great afternoon.